Next up, we have uh, Josh Warren and Greg Griffin with David Evans and Associates, and we'll be welcoming back uh, Dan Gorley with ITD, and they will be presenting on the preservation of the Moy Bridge um, through development of an asset management plan. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here and uh, excited to go through and uh, just uh, be part of the presentation team here for the uh, development of the Moy Bridge Asset Management Plan. Uh, my name, again, is Greg Griffin. I was a project manager for the Asset Management Plan work. Um, Josh Warren, he was uh, also with Dave and Evans, but he's also going to be going through and uh, presenting his portion of the work. He was a project engineer uh, just for the asset management plan. Dan Gorley is going to uh, step in and give ITD's perspective on how they view and use the asset management plan in practice. I also just wanted to recognize uh, Darren LeMay. Uh, he was the ITD uh, liaison uh, project manager just for the asset management plan. And also Stantec. We uh, had Stantec as a subconsultant in this project just for their expertise in uh, coding systems, as this was, as you'll see, just a, uh, just a major steel truss. So again, to kind of like the presentation outline, I just wanted to mention is that our presentation is going to focus on mainly on the life cycle cost analysis development. I think uh, the Prine River Bridge, that was a very well done presentation about all the nuts and bolts, the steps that took place to get us to the asset management plan. But we're going to focus on life cycle co cost analysis. So I'm going to go through, give, give just kind of a history uh, of the bridge uh, data assessment that we did. Uh, Josh is going to go through and go through all really the heavy lifting that that really happened to come up with life cycle cost analysis strategies, and then also just the asset management plan. As I mentioned, Dan's going to step in and go through and uh, just give an uh, overview on um, ITD's perspective, our objectives just to extend the service life of the structure to 100 years. Trying to do that through an asset management plan. We just want to say the Moye Bridge, the whole motivation really here is, it's a major structure as you'll see here again, but just a significant cost to replace. And then trying to go through and develop this asset management plan using different strategies, plans that we kind of developed and recommended one, just using combination of the maintenance and rehabilitation schemes just to get it to that 100-year service life. The Moye Bridge is located in the panhandle of Idaho. The Moye Bridge, it's located on US-2, and it's it servicing kind of the local communities, Moye Springs and uh, Bonners Ferry, and it, it's a major truck route. Uh, just in northern Idaho. It crosses over the Moy River Canyon, which is, it's about 300 uh, feet deep. The, the layout of the bridge, so as I mentioned, is that it's crossing over Moya Canyon. The, the, the truss span right here, that's what's crossing over the canyon and connected with the uh, steel end spans. So the end spans are 270 feet and the main span is approximately 380 feet. And, it's, and again, it's, it's a painted steel truss. You can see here just from, this is actually taken in our site visit that we conducted uh, end of July when it was mega hot out there, close to 100. And we were on the east approach right here and you can just see siding down kind of the canyon. You can see kind of the challenges of this site itself because it's, it's very steep terrain. Right here, this is where we had an access point back on that pier on the end span of the truss to be able to access the catwalk just for inspection. So that's what's in the, the right uh, picture right there, just a section of the, of the system itself, the framework and the trusses. Timeline of the bridge. So the bridge was originally constructed in 1965. Uh, just went through just some minor uh, retrofit type of work, but I wanted to focus a little bit here on the 2012 rehabilitation project included in that. So that was something that ITD put together, and as part of that evaluation that they had, it was they looked at the deck, they did some non-destructive testing, and found out that just with some minor repairs, they were going to be able to go through and continue to use the deck if they installed the polymer concrete overlay, which they did. Uh, another aspect of the work was this truss itself. It had two intermediate type of expansion joints just due to the construction of the truss. It's not necessarily a true continuous truss. It's like a cantilever truss with a drop-in span, but there was joints just in the deck itself. Of course, joints leak, right? So it just caused all kinds of grief just on the painted steel. And so what ITD did was they removed those joints, replaced it with a, just with uh, just the deck, and so now they had a continuous deck from 
end of bridge to end of bridge, that is of the truss itself, and included, as I mentioned, with the leaking joints, they included uh, just, a, uh, just some significant zone painting. I'm gonna refer to just as kind of like our data point here, just for the condition, uh, just go through that, a little bit of history on the condition. And this was based on the 2020 desktop review that we conducted. And so the bridge deck itself was found to be in satisfactory condition, so corresponding to an MBI rating of six. And so was the superstructure and the substructure. Now diving in here a little deeper, and this is what I'm gonna to wanna to focus on here a little bit for uh, just some background is the protective coating for the truss. Uh, just what was what was reported was uh, a condition state two for 35% of the uh, the coating itself. So just in, it was in fair condition, uh, and this really indicates it's the coating system at the end of its useful life. I mean, at this time, this was basically 55 years of life, which is excellent, you know, just for painted steel. And then, you know, just some crust, cr crust corrosion that was being uh, ongoing and beginning to develop. What I want to do is just spend a little bit of time here just uh, on the paint system itself, the, the existing paint system, its condition, because as you'll see as Josh goes through developing the uh, life cycle cost alternatives, this this was a major uh, portion of the of the work and it's in an expensive uh, uh, scheme so the the paint system itself what we found in our desktop study more to the west of the structure is indicated in red as we noticed the lower portion of the structure and, and going into the bottom cord and the diagonals there was more corrosion as compared to the east side that over here is yellow and just the green green means good there's very little corrosion but you could tell that Overall, even when it was in good condition, no corrosion, the paint was beginning to crack a little bit. Again, the whole indicator is that it's at the end of its useful life. So as we kept on with our desktop study and our site visit, what we noticed, the correlation for the main corrosion was just the drainage system itself. The water's always the culprit, right? So on the, the deck system had a scupper system on the left, left hand portion or the west side, a portion of the truss and just extend a little bit under the soffit of the deck. And so just the overspray just from that water, um, you know, just draining off the structure. On the right side, it's a contained drain pipe system, what conveyed the water over to this slope. And the reason just, it's interesting to be honest with you, is that this slope is extremely steep as you kind of saw in some of these photos. And the designers from what we understood, they were concerned about creating some type of unstable situation on that slope. So that's why they use a, a contained system. So just a couple pictures we took from this catwalk whenever we did this site visit. And this was a great place to be in the middle of July. I can still remember that, but you can see the river below. So you're way up in the air. But right here, this is on the west side, just some, you know, just some in the bottom cord. You can see just the corrosion that was really beginning to develop right here in that diagonal. We didn't notice any pack rust. We didn't get didn't climb the structure, we couldn't get hands on it. So this was just what we were able to see and we weren't able to climb, you know, do anything to investigate further what was going on inside that member. This is on the east side where we had the uh, contained drainage system. Again, the paint system from here, it looks pretty decent, but again, at the end of its useful life. Right here, you kind of see that section right there. That was part of that zone painting project in 2012 that I mentioned. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Josh, who's gonna go through and get into life cycle cost analysis and our approach that we took as a team. Big question is, you know, how do we approach this asset management plan? And then also what uh, actions need to take place in order for the bridge to reach its 100-year service life, and then in what order do those take place? And so to do that, we went to FHWA. Thank you, Ed. So, <laughs> so we, uh, in this FHWA Bridge Preservation Guide, they outline, uh, they kind of categorize the different uh, actions for preservation, and they have preventative maintenance, rehabilitation, and then replacement. And then within preventative maintenance, there are cyclical activities, and these are essentially cleaning the bridge, sweeping, you know, activities that like DOT maintenance can actually perform themselves. And then condition-based activities are a little more involved. It's like deck patching, deck repairs, uh, painting, joints, uh, overlays, etc. So those are the condition-based activities. And then a step further is rehabilitation, and that's full partial deck replacement, uh, peer strengthening, member strengthening, and things of that nature. 
and then the red is when you need to replace the bridge. And so we looked at all of these for the Moye Bridge. Like I said, the question is what activities apply to this particular structure? So cyclical maintenance, it's pretty straightforward, clean the bridge. This uh, structure has uh, a lot of logging truck traffic. You saw it's up in the North Panhandle of Idaho. So there's a lot of debris that builds up on not necessarily the joints because they're self-cleaning, but in the deck drains themselves. And then condition-based maintenance. This is a list of the activities that we identified that apply to this bridge. And what I want to just draw your attention to here is this, uh, these two columns on the right. One is the remaining service life. Like Greg said, in 2012, there was a, a, a repair job, and part of that was that polyester concrete overlay and non-destructive deck testing. And uh, with that, there's still some remaining service life left on, on that overlay. And then on the right is the actual service life of a particular action or particular element, action on a particular element. Starting at the top, looking down, we're actually looking east here, first action is seal the barriers. That's, this is condition-based maintenance. Pretty straightforward, five-year intervals. And then the, the second is the deck repairs and the PPC overlay. Like I said, there's, there's one out there right now. The deck's actually in really good shape for, for a bridge that's 65 years old. So that wasn't a real big priority for us. Uh, and then the joints, you saw those, those um, it was like a sliding finger plate joint. Uh, we're recommending replacing those with modular joints with a lifespan of about 40 years, and then replacing those glands every 10 years. At the ends of the structure are compression seals, and uh, replace those every 10 years. You get underneath, and this is where you see the two biggest risks on this whole asset management plan. To the right is the, the slope on the east end of the bridge. That has uh, significant erosion, and so that needs to be addressed in, well, it, as part of the asset management plan. And then there's the catwalk. We want to make sure we're safe doing the inspections across this, so that, that's also included. And then the big thing, like, like what Greg had talked about, was the paint. And with the paint, we, we narrowed it down to essentially two paint uh, strategies. One is a full blast and repaint, and then the second would just be a spot coat. And there's, you know, a 40-year assumed life and a 20-year assumed life, and all these life spans are just for the purposes of planning. And then throughout the life of the bridge, there would be inspections to verify that. In addition, we have the the drainage. You know, Greg mentioned the scuppers. So if we're going to fix the paint and address it, we need to actually address the drainage. And so that's included in the plan. You can see if I can pan over here to the right. There's an existing scupper. You can see the detail from the, the plans themselves. And that, uh, we want to collect the water, reroute it, and then discharge it somewhere where it's not going to cause that problem anymore. We just have some miscellaneous, you know, pier patching, spalls, your standard patching. Uh, and then when the paint projects are conducted, we want to clean and uh, repaint the bearings. Greg also, he mentioned the rehabilitation of that pier. And so this is you know, a little step further. It's not the condition-based maintenance, but actual rehabilitation. And right now, we just want to monitor that pier. It, it's been repaired, keep an eye on it. And then there's also another pier with the same detailing that, that would be monitored as well. For replacement, we looked at two options. One was a steel plate girder. I'm sure you can see the text on that, right? <laughs> so anyway, it's a 430-foot span, main span, with the 330-foot end spans. The second option was a cast-in-place segmental structure uh, with a 530-foot main span and 345-foot end spans. And these are just concepts just to kind of get a ballpark cost of what would it cost to replace the bridge so we can plug that into the plan. Here's a couple of sections. Notably, the uh, pier height is between 160 and 200 feet high. Not quite as tall as the prime, but this is a, like as, as Dan will talk about later, this is a major structure and it's expensive to replace it. So we talked about what we're recommending. Then the question is when, you know, in what order do we do these, do these improvements? And so we looked at basically four strategies. And the first is do nothing. 
And I think we can all agree that's probably not the recommended option if we're in a preservation conference, but we need to talk about it anyway. Okay. And then the second, actually the next three strategies are related to drainage and paint. And we're going to address the drainage in all of these up front, but then the next question is, when do you paint and how much do you paint? And so strategy two is a full blast and recoat. Address all the paint in the near term. And then in the future, you would just do some spot painting. Second, or I guess it'd be the third strategy is to address the drainage and then also uh, do some spot paint early on. This is a little less expensive up front. And then we would come back in when the polyester overlay needs to be replaced and then do a full paint. Third strategy is to defer the paint. This is the cheapest up front, and then you would come in and do a full repaint in 15 years when that polyester overlay theoretically needs to be replaced. How do we analyze all this? Being an engineer, we made a spreadsheet. So this is a spreadsheet for each of the different alternatives, and there's a lot of information packed into this thing, and I'm just going to highlight just a couple key points from it. So first off, uh, we use on the left, you can see we used ITD bid items, and, and that allowed us to do two things. First, it allowed us to get accurate pricing data based off of ITD bid cost information. And then the second is eventually this is going to roll into a PS&E project. And so we've already done some of the legwork so that, that these bid items then can roll into like preliminary design and so on. On the right are some quantities. And not that we really want to talk about quantities, but the theme here is keep it simple. And we tried to just use very straightforward quantity calculations. So again, it's all kind of packed into one uh, snapshot for each alternative. Coming back in, and then in the meat of this is the actual life cycle cost. And so for each alternative at five-year intervals, we evaluated whether or not an activity took place. So for example, deck repairs, if you select it in 2035, it would populate a cost. Thing to note here is inflation. And we're all very aware of inflation right now, probably more so than most of us in our career. This was also 2020. And so we use 3% when this was created. They need to be revised. You know, but the, the idea here is, you know, this gives you the tools to count for inflation when you're actually comparing different cost alternatives. And so there's that factor in the orange that you see across the top. Put all this together, we have four strategies. Each strategy has an annual cost for a given year and then a cumulative cost over the lifespan of that alternative or that strategy. Put it together in a graph so you don't have to read a bunch of small numbers. You can see the big red is what we don't want to do, and that's do nothing. And then if you zoom in a little closer, then we, we actually go into more of the nit and, or nitty gritty of the actual um, life cycle cost. And what I'll point out here is the green, that's strategy two, that's the full paint. And so there's an additional initial cost to do that painting that's a lot right now. But if you go to 2035, you can see that that actually becomes the lowest cost over the lifespan of the, of the bridge. And so that became our recommended alternative. And the reason, there's two reasons. Number one is inflation. You can see the little dotted line for the inflation factor. And then the second is the cost of containment. You have to do two paint projects for some of these, and that's, that's double the containment cost. Put it all together, here's strategy two. Uh, you've got timeline, activities, cyclical, condition-based, rehab, total replacement, circling back to our asset management you know, timeline. We're at 2020, we zoom in, and we've identified four projects with specific key components that are needed in order to reach that 2065 goal of 100-year life with NBI ratings for all the elements greater than four. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan, and he will talk about how these are plugged into ITD. Without uh, trying to repeat myself, we did put this bridge into our uh, AstroWare uh, program. So I'll go through a couple of these slides pretty quickly, and then I'll, as my coworker Melissa would say, I'll wrap it up and put a bow tie on it. Anyway, here's the, um, the actions again put into BRM, just to show that the um, we're following the plan that uh, they produced for us. And then this is our deterioration curve. Uh, the blue line is pretty darn similar to the one you, you saw earlier. Based on those actions, again, a, a little bit of a repeat on the, 
these elements and their actions uh, and then um, again uh, we, we freeze these in our program for the scenarios but just to kind of to wrap it up on Idaho's asset management plans ITT's 10 largest bridges by deck area have an average age of anywhere from 31 to 33 years old these 10 bridges is, uh, are about 1.5 million square feet of our deck area and just these 10 bridges out of the 1835 we have represent about 12 percent of all the bridge deck area on our state highway system so that has a tremendous effect on the improvement of our our modeling out of 1800 bridges we can focus in on uh, 12 12 percent of our program and it just improves that model. Um, it'd be almost impossible to do all of our program and to put this much effort into each single bridge. But for these signature bridges or the bridges that are really causing us problems, it's money well spent. So just to finish up here, these are the 10 bridges. Uh, we have uh, our Interstate I-90 going over a small town that's over top of the town. We call it the Wallace Viaduct. And then we have our Ponderé Bridge about a mile long. And then um, I-90 again on Bennett Bay and I-90 on Blue Creek Bay. And then uh, um, the Morris Creek one we talked about, the Prime we talked about earlier. and. Um, I, we have the, probably the largest K frame that's actually probably made in the United States on our White Bird Bridge. It's pretty impressive as a K frame. And so uh, these are just bridge costs. These aren't overall project costs that I'm showing here. So just for the bridge replacement. So it definitely helps in our pro program scenarios and uh, communicating to our management and our legislatures on what's appropriate for planning in the future in regards to our funding. So that's all I have. Uh, let's open it up to questions. The question that I have for you all is, when you're talking about uh, repainting, what kind of surface prep did you assume? What kind of coating did you place a two-coat, three-coat system? What kind of service life did you expect for that repainting, recoating, you know, the full system if you want? Okay, so we can tag team this between me and Josh. So, yeah, we, we brought in Stantec to get recommendations from their paint experts. So uh, the the system that we went with with the full repaint, we were anticipating 40-year life, and it's basically using uh, the current IDD type of uh, paint system, which I believe is inorganic zinc and to the intermediate and a top coat paint. Yeah, that's with the, right. That's with the full blast option. So when you say inorganic zinc, are we talking about metallizing first? No, no, no. I'm saying that's 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 the primer. So that's the primer coat. It's oh. the inorganic zinc type of a primer itself after it's went through and blasted. Then you know, it's kind of the challenge you saw with the trust members themselves that they're built up boxes. So that was a challenge to be able to go through and understand not only that area but uh, access. In to go through in doing uh, just the, you know, the the blast cleaning itself. So well, we did the best we could at this point in time to make an estimate. Yeah, the reason I asked the question is because NetPep had a lot of, a lot of different uh, paint systems, three coat systems and whatnot. Based on their analysis, the typical uh, service life is the best for a metallized system. You're looking at about 40 years. You know, hot to galvanizing about 40 years. The rest of those organic coatings, depending on the condition, in a mild environment, you could probably get about 30. In mm -hmm. a severe environment, you're talking about 15. So right. that's a huge difference in terms of what service life it is. Particularly for the record system, you're looking at the low end of the service life. Mm -hmm. So that totally depends on how much salt you can get it out, how much pitting you have, how you can clean it, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Just was wondering. Thank you. Then just the other other thing on that is the you know it's one of the reasons that drove to the the full full blast was if if we did just a spot paint you haven't really addressed the problem and so we wanted to get it to a clean surface so that we could do it and it's also a pretty arid environment and so I think that's why the paint expert recommended higher but yeah it would definitely need to be monitored so I was glad that you um, decided on the full repaint because the 20 year life on a spot paint or overcoat mm -hmm. I don't think that's accurate because with the old lead based systems I've seen them repainted and fail within a year or two mm -hmm. so I don't know who came up with the 20 years but 
based on experience and based on other bridges, I'm mm -hmm. sure it's going to be way less than that. Mm -hmm. And with repainting jobs, you have full containment. And mm -hmm. once you get that full containment system up there, it's just best to go down the bare metal and build your system back up. Yeah. And then to respond to the last question, many of these bridges in North Idaho, Western Montana, this one built in 65, so you see what 57 years with the original paint system. Mm -hmm. If done right, an organic uh, primer and then two coats on top of that should give you about the same performance if you keep the water off. Mm -hmm. So you fix the drainage system, mm -hmm. you could probably get 40, 50 years out of that type of paint system. When we did our rehab about 10 years ago, I think it was, yep. on that timeline, um, I would say um, any of the areas that, where the joints were repaired or we went over the joints and we eliminated the joints, those that spot painting is doing very well. The only place the spot painting is not doing well is the finger joints where the water and the salts get through. So I would say that's doing very poorly. Mm -hmm. So the, the other areas, you know, they're, I imagine we'll get more than 20 years on the spot painting, but, um, but point well taken where it gets exposed. Just curious, does this, going through this effort and putting it into your system, does that lock it into the budget so that you have the funds there, or do you have to still fight for it every time you try to do something? It locks it into our scenarios and our our, uh, our modeling and the different scenarios based on different fundings. However, we always have to prioritize. So there might be something down the road that takes priority, and we don't have unlimited funding, so that these things could get adjusted in the system, and maybe um, maybe the frozen plan gets tweaked a little bit. So, so for instance, if we're not following the maintenance uh, plan or the districts just don't have the resources, uh, that could have an effect on it. It'll have to get adjusted. But for the scenarios, it's locked down. Um, but as you're saying, it, you know, there might be something that has a higher priority and then the adjustments have to be made. But in regards to deterioration and the effort, it's really zeroing in on what the bridge really needs and how we model it at this time for our 10-year projections and things of that nature. Uh, so we can advise um, the decision makers makers on uh, to hopefully plan for these bigger projects. Um, so hopefully I explained that correctly. Any uh, trust deterioration in the steel? Was it all just freckled rust or any evaluation for, I don't know, condition, fatigue life, anything like that? No, that's a good question. So maybe the, the, the first one just on the rust type of assessment. Again, we didn't go through, we, we didn't see the need after we did our site inspection to go through and into climate and just to get up close. And I will also say that uh, I can't remember when the, uh, there's a fact, fracture critical inspection that was previously done several years before and there wasn't any note of any like pitting, pack rust or anything like that on the structure. Yeah, section loss. We, again, we didn't notice it. On, if you notice in some of those pictures that I showed, that was pretty uh, typical just of the sections that you're gonna see. Again, we couldn't look inside that bottom cord, that box, but from everything we could tell, you know, it's just really at the onset, you need to do something here. I mean, that, that's really what that thing tells you. Now go back to fatigue. So we, we didn't wanna get into this, but we did not do a fatigue study on that bridge. I mean, just actually go through, do a assessment of our best guess on where it's at right now and project it back out for what now we're at what no 40 what 43 more years and just say is it going to make it or not now i would i would also like to say though on one of the approach bands it was noted that where there was a, a, a little bitty fatigue crack that was noted several years ago that's being monitored but i mean just from everything we can tell is it's a distortion based induced fatigue crack just right at the root of one of those welds you know, just because it, the, the, the stiffener plate wasn't welded to the bottom flange. So th that's how we left it. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you guys very much. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.